The gunpowder empires describes three empires that rose up that had Islam in common. They were initially successful as a result of their own military might, along with the weakness and corruption of the regimes that they replaced. As European nations fought among themselves rather than uniting to topple the new powers growing in the East, the gunpowder empires further expanded. The warrior leaders of the Ottoman, Safavid, and Mughal empires shared many traits besides being Muslims. They descended from Turkic nomads who once lived in Central Asia. They spoke a Turkish language. They took advantage of the power vacuums left by the breakup of the Mongol Khanates, and they relied on gunpowder weapons such as artillery and cannons. The invasion of Central Asia and the Middle East by Tamerlane, also known as Timur the Lane, who was a Mongol Turkic ruler of the late 14th century, set the stage for the rise of the Turkic empires, leading an army partly composed of nomadic invaders from the broad steppes of Eurasia. Tamerlane moved out from the trading city of Samarkand in modern day Uzbekistan to make ruthless conquests in Persia, which is modern day Iran, and also in India. The Eurasian steppes were also the birthplace of the Ghazi ideal, a model for warrior life that blended the cooperative values of nomadic culture with the willingness to serve as a holy fighter for Islam. According to some historians, the Ghazi ideal served as a model for warriors who participated in the rise of the gunpowder empires, and it was a model that fit Tamerlan well. Some historians believe that Tamerlan's violent takeover of the areas of Central Asia included the massacre of some 100,000 Hindus before the gates of Delhi in India. The pattern of conquest was marked by violence that resulted in new dynasties, the Ottomans, the Safavids, and the Mughals. Nonetheless, Tamerlane's rule in Samarkand encouraged learning and the arts, a trend also typical of these later empires. For example, Tamerlane championed literature, and he himself corresponded with European rulers and wrote his own memoirs. Buildings still standing in the city of Samarkand are lasting reminders of his interest in architecture and decorative arts. While the empire Tamerlane created largely fell apart, except for the area his descendant, Babar, would take over to create India's Mughal dynasty, Tamerlane's divisions were a testament to the significance of gunpowder. He used it to build a government dependent upon his military and the use of heavy artillery. He also used it to protect land routes on the Silk Roads. However, he failed to leave an effective political structure in many of the areas he conquered. Without effective government, the expenses of the wars eventually ravaged the empire's economy. Tamerlane's rule cast lights on two major forces that battled each other continually from the late 10th century to the 14th century, Mongols from the Northeast versus Islamic forces from Arabia and the areas around the Mediterranean Sea. These forces would clash continuously with the rise and fall of the three Asian gunpowder empires. By the 15th century, the Ottoman Empire was already becoming a major power, extending into modern-day Turkey as well as to the Balkan areas of Europe and parts of North Africa and Southeast Asia. The Ottoman Empire was the largest and most enduring of the great Islamic empires of this period. Founded by the Osman dynasty in the 1300s, the empire lasted until its defeat in 1918 by the Allies in World War I. Thus, a single dynasty controlled the empire for more than 600 years. This is a map that shows the extent of the Ottoman Empire between their height in 1683 and then their fall in 1914. They controlled all the major land routes, as you can see, in Africa, um, Arabia, even Europe. Quite an extensive empire. Called the Conqueror, 
Mahmed II firmly established the empire's capital after his forces besieged Constantinople in 1453. Despite its triple fortifications, the city fell as its walls crumbled under the bombardment of Ottoman cannons. The Ottomans used a 26-foot bronze cannon and several other cannons from 15 to 22 feet in length. Under Mehmed II's rule, the city, its name changed to Istanbul, prospered because of its location. A nexus for trade, the city controlled the Bosporus Strait, the only waterway linking the Aegean Sea with the Black Sea. The armies of Mehmed II next seized land around the western edge of the Black Sea. Then they moved into the Balkans in Southeast Asia. To counter the power of Venice, an expanding state on the Adriatic Sea with a robust maritime trade, Mehmed strengthened the Ottoman navy and attacked various areas of Italy. Although he did not conquer Venice, he forced the city to pay him a yearly tax. In the early 16th century, the Ottomans added their empire lands in present-day Syria, Israel, Egypt, and Algeria. When the Mamluk dynasty power declined in Egypt, Istanbul became a center of Islam. The Ottoman Empire reached its peak under Solomon I. His armies overran Hungary in 1526 and in 1529 were hammering at the gates of Vienna, the main city in Austria. Their attempt to take Vienna failed twice, but the ability of the Ottomans to send troops so far into Christian Europe caused great fear there. In 1522, Solomon's navy captured the island of Rhodes, now part of Greece, in the eastern Mediterranean, which had long been a stronghold of Christian knights. In the 1550s, the Ottoman navy took control of Tripoli in North Africa. The Ottoman Empire would experience a transformation as the state adapted to new internal and external pressures. A period of reform would be followed by in the excuse me, a period of reform would follow by the 18th century. Challenges in defending Ottoman territory against foreign invasion and occupation led to the Ottomans' defeat and dissolution by 1922. The Safavid dynasty had its origin in the Safavid order of Sufism, which is an offshoot of Islam, and it was established in the northern region of Iran, known today as Azerbaijan. An early Safavid military hero named Ishmael conquered most of Persia and pushed into Iraq. Although only 14 or 15 years old, he soon conquered all of Iran and was proclaimed Shah, which is the equivalent of king or emperor, in 1501. The Safavid Empire's greatest extent covered this area. You see there on the Persian Gulf, here's the Arabian Sea into the Indian Ocean. Um, here's India right here. But this is what today we would call Iran and then parts of Iraq, moving up into the Caspian Sea. So that was their greatest extent. They, they did not expand as much as our other ones because guess who's right here? <laughs> the Ottomans. And so you can almost see, and then over here, there's the Mughals. So you can see that the Safed Empire just did not expand. Then you have growing Russia up here. There's really nowhere there for them to go. The Safavid Empire had two problems. First, despite being on the Arabian Sea, which was part of the Indian Ocean, the empire did not have a real navy. Second, the Safavids lacked natural defenses. Nevertheless, the Safavids rose to power in the 1500s due to their land-based military might and strong leadership. Called Abbas the Great, Shah Abbas I presided over the Safavid Empire at its height. His troops included soldiers, often Christian boys, pressed into service from as far northwest as Georgia and Russia. Abbas imported weaponry from Europe and also relied on Europeans to advise his troops about this newly acquired military technology. Slowly, the Shahs came to control religion as well as politics. Using Shia Islam as a unifying force, Shah Ishmael built a power base that supported his rule and denied legitimacy to any Sunni Muslim. 
This strict adherence to Shia Islam caused frequent hostilities with the Ottoman Empire, a stronghold of Sunni Islam. In 1541, Safavid forces were stopped by the Ottoman at the city of Tabriz in Persia that became part of a border conflict between Sunni and Shia societies. The hostility between the two groups lives on in present-day Iraq and Iran. Conflicts between the Ottomans and the Safavids were not entirely religious, however. Another conflict arose over control of overland trade routes. The Ottomans used trade embargoes and official bans on trade consistently against the Safavid silk traders as a way to assert dominance over their eastern rival. Women are rarely mentioned in local Safavid histories. However, Safavid women were permitted to participate in their societies. While Safavid women were still veiled and restricted in their movements, as was tradition in that region, they had access to rights provided by Islamic law for inheritance and, in extreme cases, divorce. In the 1520s, Babar, a descendant of Tamerlane, founded a 300-year dynasty during a time when India was in disarray. He completed conquest in northern India and, under the new Mughal name, formed a central government similar to that of Suleiman in Turkey. Akbar, Babar's grandson, achieved grand religious and political goals. Here's the greatest extent of the Mughal Empire. They're going to begin right here. In these areas today, this would be modern-day Pakistan, Afghanistan. Here's uh, the Kashmir region that remains a hotbed of activity today. And so you're going to see they do expand into Bangladesh as well and other areas. Their problem is when they try to go south, these were fiercely independent kingdoms and vastly different than the north and very strictly Hindu. The Mughal Empire under Akbar was one of the richest and best governed states in the world. Overseas trade flourished during the relatively peaceful period. Arab traders conducted most of the commerce. Traded goods included textiles, tropical foods, spices, and precious stones, all of which were exchanged for gold and silver. Trade within the borders of the empire was carried on by a merchant caste. Members of the merchant caste were allowed to participate in banking and the production of handicrafts. The caste system in India were strict social groupings designated at birth. The, has, the caste system tended to divide Hindu people. The Indian caste system is the basis of educational and vocational opportunities for Indian society. It also kept them very divided. And even though it was a Hindu tradition, our Islamic kingdom will continue it. Today in India, the caste system is illegal. It's been illegal since uh, Gandhi's work in 1948, but that doesn't mean it's still not practiced. In its origins, it was very simple. It was just a system to organize laborers, to organize people by profession. And so you get the top caste right here, which were priests and teachers originally. The next one was warriors and rulers. Um, the next one was farmers, traders, merchants, laborers, and then lastly, uh, the outcast who are, did the jobs nobody else wanted to do. And, and so this was in its origins, you know, very simple today. There's over 6,000 of them, and they can be quite cruel. There's no sense of movement within this caste system. If, in fact, if you're born, for instance, in this caste, and then you try to be in this one, um, you're going to have a bad next life. You'll be punished for that. So they had this, this thing built in their religion that said if you moved from one caste to another, you could be punished. And so people didn't move, and the whole system was meant to keep everybody in their place. You know, one man is going to be born into this caste right here, and he didn't want to be a warrior. He wanted to be a priest. He wanted to be um, a monk, and he went on that path, and that man's name became Buddha. Mughal India flourished from Babar's time through the early 18th century. Magnificent agricultural accomplishments are remaining testaments to the wealth and sophistication of the Mughal Empire. 
The Ottoman, Safavid, and Mughal empires declined as Western Europe grew in strength economically and militarily, particularly in terms of sea power. Unlike these three Islamic empires, Russia modernized and reorganized its army, modeling it after the armies of England, France, and the Netherlands. The Islamic empires did not modernize, and as a result, Russia remained powerful enough to survive as an independent nation-state, while the un other gunpowder empires fell. In 1571, after Solomon's death, a European force made up mostly of Spaniards and Venetians defeated the Ottomans in a great naval conflict known as the Battle of Lepanto. After the reign of Solomon, the Ottomans fell victim to weak sultans and strong European neighbors. In time, the empire became known as the Sick Man of Europe. Successors to Solomon were often held hostage to harem politics, the efforts of wives and concubines of the sultan to promote their own children as likely heirs to the throne. In this way, some women became powerful behind the scenes. The failed siege of Vienna in 1683 marked a turning point in the Ottoman domination in Eastern Europe. British and French involvement in the Ottoman territories, Greece independence in 1821, and the Russian expansion in the 19th century further weakened the Ottoman empires. The ineffectual leaders who followed Shah Abbas I combined lavish lifestyles and military spending with falling revenues, resulting in a weakened economy. In 1722, Safavid forces were not able to quell a rebellion by the heavily oppressed Sunni Pushtuns in present-day Afghanistan. The Afghan forces went on to sack Ishfaha, and their leader, Muhammad, declared himself Shah of Persia. While the Safavid dynasty remained nominally in control, the resulting chaos was an impediment to the centralization and tax collection. Taking advantage of the weakened Safavids, the Ottomans and the Russians were able to seize territory. The Safavid dynasty declined rapidly until it was replaced by the Zand dynasty in 1760. The Mughal Empire began to decline under the reign of Aurangzeb. He inherited an empire weakened by corruption and the failure to keep up with military innovations also hurt. Nevertheless, Aurangzeb hoped to increase the size of the empire and bring all of India under Muslim rule. Additionally, he wanted to rid the empire of its Hindu influences. In expanding the empire to the south, he drained the empire's treasury and was unable to put down peasant uprising. Some of these uprisings were sparked by Aurangzeb's insistent on an austere and pious Islamic lifestyle and an intolerance of minority religions like the Sikhs, the Hindus, and others. His policies led to frequent conflict and rebellions. There were revolts as well among the Hindu and Islamic princes. The empire grew increasingly unstable after his death, which allowed the British and the French to gain more and more economic power in India. The British would take political power away from the Mughals in the 19th century. This section has discussed the expansion of empires between 1450 and 1750, especially in Russia, China, Southwest Asia, Central Asia, and South Asia. Although it may seem obvious what an empire is, historians have thought carefully about the concept of an empire. A concept is a general abstract idea often formed from specific instances. For example, one historian said this, as a general phenomenon, empires extend relations of power across territorial spaces over which they have no prior or given legal sovereignty, and where in one or more of the domains of economics, politics, and culture, they gain some me measure of extensive hegemony over those spaces for the purpose of extracting value. Stephen Ho, in his book Empire, argues that an empire typically also has a diverse ethnic, national, cultural, and religious elements under its power. If you combine these two concepts, then you get this idea that features of the empire include extension of power over spaces in which they have no previous or legal control, exertion of major control of economic, political, or cultural aspects of subjects, 
extraction or accumulation of value as a result of domination and control of a diverse ethnic, national, cultural, and religious element.